Discord. You can hear the lovely robot lady announcing that we are here. Welcome to this Ask Me Anything webinar with your graduate assistants at the Harvard Divinity School Office of Admissions. So we are going to just give you about a 10 minute pitch about what HDS is and give you a little introduction to ourselves. And then at the end, we will have time for questions that you can drop in the Q&A function. So if you have any questions that you think of as we are talking, you can just go ahead and put them in the Q&A and then we will get to them when we are done with the presentation section. All right. Good afternoon, evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, my name is Atia. I am a first year MDiv student, um, a graduate assistant in the HTS Office of Admissions. Um, my academic interests are music therapy, spiritual care and counseling, and African diasporic religions. Um, outside of being at HDS, I like to make music. I like just being outside. I like jujitsu. I like doing all different types of martial arts. Um, balances out the, the divinity school energy in me. Um, and then, um, I like, I, I'm looking forward to getting to explore Harvard's libraries. It's my first year, so I only know HDS virtually, and I'm excited to get to the physical campus. Hey everyone, I'm Kate. I'm a second year Master of Theological Studies student with an area of focus in women, gender, and sexuality. I'm primarily interested in pro-choice religious movements and organizations, but I am also interested in non-religious people and spiritual but not religious people and how they use um, religious ritual. I myself am non-religious, and so this is something that is important to me. And I've also served as an abortion doula supporting people in clinic during the procedure. So that's a little bit behind my ethos of my research. I'm planning to apply to doctoral programs at some point in the future. Uh, well, at HDS, I've worked in this job in the Office of Admissions, and I've also worked at the Pluralism Project, which is a Harvard initiative that creates resources about interfaith work in the United States. And I have also worked in the Widener Library, which is a very fun job. So any questions about those jobs, I'm happy to answer as well. And then on campus, I am involved in queer rights and I'm queer myself. So if you have questions about being queer at HDS, happy to answer those. I've also been involved in the HDS Graduate Journal, the new HDS Health and Spirituality Club. And also I'm on the Noon Service Steering Committee and you'll hear a little bit more about Noon Service later. In my free time, I enjoy bullet journaling and playing the banjo. And you can see in that picture on the left is me with all my stuff packed up, ready to move from Minnesota to Boston. And you can see the banjo sticking out from behind me. It's a very important element of my packing and moving experience. It's a great picture. <laughs> so uh, let's meet HDS and fun facts about Harvard Divinity School. Um, we're the first non-sectarian theological institution in the United States. Um, students can cross-register at up to 50% of their classes. So what that means is you kind of have the ability to take classes across the university and at other schools in the Boston area, which is a great opportunity about HDS. Um, usually about 120 people in each incoming class. We have 30 religious traditions represented as well as many non-religious students like myself and Kate. Um, the age ranges are 21 to 69, and then the degree programs. So the main two degree programs that we have um, are the MTS degree, the Master of Theological Studies, which is a two-year program, and the Master of Divinity, um, which is a three-year program. Um, and there's a lot of overlap between these programs, but the difference is obviously the duration of them. Um, the MTS program, you have an area of focus that you get to pick. I think there are eight of them, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and then in the MDiv program, as a requirement, you have a field placement, um, as well as a thesis in your final year. So those kind of, um, that, that kind of shows you the difference between the programs, but I would always recommend to look at the, we have a nice chart on our website that Kate, I know Kate loves and <laughs> puts in so many emails. So um, we can, we'll put a link to that and that gives you a good overview of the differences between those. 
Um, the Master of Theolog Theology, the THM degree is a one year program and that's generally geared towards people who already have a Master of Divinity degree um, and are interested in doing more concentrated study in preparation for maybe a PhD or something along those lines. Um, and then our newest degree program just got released this week. It's weak, it's yeah. fresh, uh, new. Uh, yeah, we're all excited about it. We're, we're still learning about it ourselves, but it's the Master of Religion and Public Life. Um, and that's a one-year program. And a lot of people might be interested in it because it's a one-year program, but it is a very specific and particular program. Um, it's really geared towards uh, professionals who want to leave their field for that year and explore how religion intersects with the work that they do and then go back to their field and bring the new knowledge about religion and um, pluralism and religious literacy into the work that they're doing. And we want to give you a taste of what community life is like at HDS by sampling some regular events that you might see every week. The first is noon service, which honestly is one of my favorite things about HDS. Every single week, a different organization leads noon service. This could be a religious organization. For example, one week you might have um, the HDS Muslims leading service. And then the next week you might have the HDS atheists and agnostics leading noon service. So it's a space for a lot of creativity for those of you who are interested in ministry or in ordination, it can be a really um, powerful place for you to practice your skills. And I, as a non-religious person, love going to noon service because it allows me to support my peers as they are um, practicing their traditions and also kind of see different, different religious traditions and, and what their practices look like. And so that has been really fun and fulfilling. Next, we have community tea, which is a weekly event where essentially on Tuesday afternoons, we all just hang out and eat food together. And then a different student organization will give a little five minute pitch about what they do and how other students can support their work. We also have tons of different religious and spiritual gatherings that um, will be you know, kind of different by tradition. And so if you have a specific tradition that you're coming to HDS with, you can definitely look around on our website or reach out to us to see what kind of activities happen, what would, would be interesting for you. And then we also have lectures at the Center for the Study of World Religions. Now, when I was an undergrad, I used to like be so ready for every time that an event about religion was happening. And I would like write it down in my calendar and I'd be so excited. And now it's just like every week there are multiple events at HDS about religion. And it is so, so, so much fun to attend these lectures. You can see um, the picture on the screen right now is a picture of a lecture through the Center for the Study of World Religion. We also have talks that are given through the Women's Studies in Religion program, which is another one of my favorite things about HDS. Uh, basically every year, the Women's Studies in Religion program will bring in five scholars in religion who are doing work on um, women and gender, feminism or womanism, and these are usually scholars who are working on their first big book project. And so it can be a really special place for you to cultivate relationships with them. And you get a whole new group every year. So this is, is really wonderful. And they also, in addition to offering, um, each offering a class every year, they each offer a talk. And so, so these talks are some of my favorite things to attend. And then finally, there are tons of student organization meetings. You know, there's sort of this idea that grad school can be a really isolating time, but I have personally found at HDS that people come to HDS because they are very skilled community builders and it's what they love to do. And that really shows in our student organization. So, so I think right now we have around 40 different active student organizations and um, if you are interested in an organization that doesn't yet exist, it is very easy to create it. You just need to show that there's one other HDS student who's interested in joining. So there's a lot going on there already, and there's also a lot of room for creativity. Yeah, all right. And so now we can 
and begin to ask us anything. Um, we're going to open it up for questions. Um, before we do, just want to point out that we have our ask underscore students email, um, and Kate and I will be answering those questions. So if you have any personal questions or very specific questions to your situation, feel free to shoot us an email at that um, email address, and either Kate or I will get back to you. Um, and then for application and like more technical logistical questions, um, the admissions office, admissions at HDS is a great resource. Go ahead and email them. So yeah, um, questions. Yeah, stop sharing. Oh, yeah. Stop the sharing. And feel free to drop your questions into the Q and A. Oh, and Atiyah, I see you sent the beautiful chart, the MDA yes. versus MTS requirement chart. Um, yeah. This is one of the most common questions that we get is sort of how do you decide between choosing the MTS or the MDiv? And for some people, that can be a really tough decision because I think a lot of people could succeed in, in either program. And I think that it's particularly difficult because, you know, historically, the MTS was seen as the degree that you might do prior to getting a PhD in religious studies. And historically, the MDiv was seen as the degree that you would do before becoming ordained. And now there's just a whole variety of different careers that MTS and MDiv students go into. You know, we have, um, you know, people in the MDiv who are interested in chaplaincy, who are interested in nonprofit work, who are interested in ministry, but ministry is very broadly construed in terms of what ministry means for different people. And in, in the MTS, it's by no means all people who are interested in going into academia, but can welcome people interested in, in nonprofit work, in law, in business, in healthcare. And so it, it really depends on your personal journey and, and what kinds of things you want to get out of divinity school. And if those requirements in, in each degree program look like things that you want to do and things that would be useful for you. All right, so we have our first question, which is question. where do both of you see yourself going with your degree after you graduate? Tia, do you want to start? Sure, yes, I will try. That's a really big and hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I was avoiding it, but yes, I'll start. Um, yeah, I, I'm taking my time here to kind of think about that, but I, I'm here because I want to use the skills and the experience that I have to be of service in some way to the communities that I care about. Um, and so I really don't know exactly how that's going to look. I see um, I'm an MDiv student. So as an MDiv student, I kind of have to think about what my ministry is. And I, I think about my ministry as music because that's what I've done my entire life. And it's something that I have a lot of passion for. Um, and so I want to use that to help people. But, you know, you got to figure out how bills get paid and all that kind of stuff you know so you, you do have to think about um how you can i guess connect your interests with some more practical concerns so that's why i'm here sort of doing um but regardless of where i end up i see myself really just being at the service of a community yeah yeah i think i think divinity school can be such a perfect place to sort of figure out what specifically you want to do after graduation because there are um, so many people in different careers that I didn't even know existed. And so this can be a place to make a lot of connections and, and figure those types of things out. And that being said, like a lot of people come in and know exactly what career that they want to do and they're like ready to do it. And then they get their degree and then they do that career. Um, I am planning to apply to doctoral programs next year and hoping to become, um, to, to do research and teaching in higher education in the study of religion. And definitely this degree has had ample opportunity to prepare me for that. I feel like I have learned how to read vast amounts of, of yeah, Tia is not yes. yes. I've learned how to read vast amounts of text very quickly and figure out its strengths and weaknesses and distill my own opinion about it. And that's an essential skill. Um, I've connected with a lot of faculty who have been really helpful in kind of mentoring me and advising me as I um, try to apply for a doctoral program. 
So that's where I'm going. And I think I will send to um, a chart that I love. That's from the Career Center. That's um, sort of showing the tons of different career paths that people end up going into. Yeah, it's a good chart. Another good chart. Got a lot. Yeah, of good we're charts. all about our good charts. <laughs> So this is M MTS and MDiv degree careers 10 years out. Okay. I'm curious if you don't mind sharing a little bit about what you did for your writing sample in the application. And then also sort of worrying, I think as a lot of people do, that some of the things that they have already are too long or too short to submit. So um, yeah, so with the writing sample, you are totally welcome to take something that you've written before and crop it down to make it fit into the word limit. It's um, 1,000 to 1,500 words. And you are definitely encouraged to even write like a little sort of note at the top or an introduction explaining like where this came from, like what is the, the context of the larger paper. You're also welcome to write something totally new. We have a lot of people, especially people who are coming um, mid-career who might be like, I don't have any recent essays that I'm really interested in putting into that writing sample. And so you can produce a new piece um, to put in the writing sample and, and either of those options are, are totally okay. Um, I ended up taking an essay that I wrote in undergrad that was much, much longer than 1,000 to 1,500 words and, and, and chopping it down. Yeah, yeah. I think that also like, I, I did a similar thing when I, for my writing sample, I took a piece of my undergraduate thesis or a chapter from it and just sort of like, it was a good exercise in getting to go back to something that I had written and think about how my writing had like, change from then and so you can think about the application as like a, a growing opportunity too and like a, an opportunity to look at how you've grown over the time that you've been an undergrad and where you want to go and really just think about your skills and yeah take stock of things in that way so don't feel nervous about the writing sample I said it's something to be more like excited about because you can kind of do anything that really just shows that you can you know write and yeah. uh, express your thoughts. Yeah, the admissions committee is just interested in your ability to do analytical writing. So yeah, just keep that in mind. And if you have any more specific questions, you can reach out to, to that to the ask students email. So we have another question about the transition from undergrad to graduate school. What was it like and what have the main challenges been? So my experience, I have greatly enjoyed the transition from undergrad to graduate school because I have a lot more um, flexibility in terms of like what I am doing with my time when, because I'm just in class for less during less time during the week. Um, so each week, each class might meet for two hours, maybe three. Um, and so this has made me better able to control like which texts I'm focusing my time on and which texts aren't as important to me. And so I found that to be to be really nice. Tia, do you want to talk about your experience? Yeah, yeah. Um, I so for my undergraduate, it was sort of structured in the a similar way to how classes are now. So that wasn't too much of an adjustment for me. But um, I guess I should start by saying that I'm kind of my introduction to all of this is kind of unusual given COVID and all that. So I'm kind of having a virtual experience of things, but um, outside of that, I'd, I'd say my transition thus far has been pretty, pretty smooth. Um, there's a lot of support like in the introductory classes, um, you know, all of all students are required to take theories and methods, um, all first year students. So that's like a class that, you know, you'll see a lot of first year classmates or yeah, all the first years in. Um, and so, I've realized there's a lot of support in that class. There's writing, um, instruction, and there are a lot of like people there who are trying to help you succeed. And they recognize that you know the transition from undergrad to graduate isn't always easy because you don't always have experience reading as this much and prioritizing your time in these ways. And so um, 
yeah, for me, I, I've, I've found a lot of support and just talking to people like Kate who have more experience than me is also a good way of, of coming, going about transitioning. Yeah. Yeah, I think too, um, one of the big differences that I experienced is the amount of kind of like weekly reflection papers that are due. Yes. That was a little bit different from undergrad. And I think that, that our intro course that all the incoming MDivs and MTSs take, theories and methods in the study of religion, is really helpful in getting you accustomed to that pace because throughout that course, I think, I mean, at least this is how it was structured when I was in person last year. I don't know if it's structured differently now, yeah, but um, throughout that course, like you wrote your kind of weekly reflection paper and then you would typically read um, your like one book a week. And so this is like a situation where you, every student is assigned a um, teaching fellow who's a PhD student who can like really help you try to figure out like how to get these assignments done. And then you also all have a writing tutor who's hosting writing workshops about um, how to write the essays for the course. And so that is a class that's really important for people in terms of making transitions, whether you're coming from undergrad, straight from undergrad, a couple of years out of undergrad, or, you know, 15, 20, 30 years out of undergrad. Um, this is a course that is kind of designed to get everyone on the same page. And I thought it was really helpful. And then along those lines, we have a question, are there students at HDS who already have advanced degrees and are in the middle of a major career shift? Um, absolutely, we do. Yeah, this is, it's really common. And I think another question we, we frequently get in, in the Ask Students inbox is just people who are kind of, you know, concerned because it's been a long time since they've been in undergrad. Um, and you are not at all alone in that. We have, as Atiyah said in the short presentation, we have students ranging in age from 21 to 69. And so it's a huge range and we have people who um, already have master's degrees. We have a couple of people who already have PhDs and um, people who are really experienced in their career and have realized that they actually want to make a shift and divinity school is, is the right place to do that. Oh, and the other thing I'll add too is that if you are a mid-career student and you want to talk to another mid-career student, um, you can email us at the Ask Students email, which I'll just drop in the chat right now again, um, and we can set you up with one of our student ambassadors. Yeah, we have a lot of we have a lot of great student ambassadors who represent a bunch of different identity groups and are from all different places and are willing to talk to just about anyone who's interested in applying. So please feel free to reach out. Hey, did you apply to multiple graduate institutions and why HDS? Why might HDS not be the right program for others? That is a good question. Hmm. So I did apply to multiple graduate institutions. Um, I ultimately chose HDS for a couple of reasons. One is that I felt like HDS really prioritized social justice. And I found that to be true in the student body coming here. All of my friends are here for a very specific um, reason that involves changing institutions and, and changing um, social situations in, in the world. And I thought that that was um, really important in my divinity school experience. I was also looking for somewhere with a lot of religious diversity, especially as a non-religious person. Like I wanted to not have this sort of sharp line between MDs and MTSs, but I wanted us all to have classes all together. And that's something that is very true at HDS. If you walk into any one of my classes, you're gonna see people from, from the PhD, from the MTS, from the MDiv, from the THM. And so I feel like that creates a really collaborative and interesting environment for learning. So those were the big reasons that I chose HDS. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't actually apply to any other graduate programs. Um, HDS just seemed like the one that was right for me because of a lot of the reasons Kate said, um, specifically because uh, it, it had a very um, diverse religious community here. Um, a lot of other 
divinity schools that I looked at um, were more focused in a particular tradition. And I knew that I wasn't really committed to any particular tradition and I kind of wanted to explore and have the ability to have my ideas challenged in an environment that was very diverse and had a lot of different perspectives. Um, but with that said, to the like last part of that question, um, what might make people not the right fit for the school? Um, some people do want a traditional, um, you know, experience, a traditional divinity school experience. Um, and some people aren't as open to having as a, a, a plurality of, of worldviews around them. And maybe they do want just, a, you know, a Christian ministry or whatever. And so um, that was something that when I, when I came here, I met people, um, when I came to visit before I applied, I met people who that was the case for them. They wanted a more traditional um, Christian ministry uh, experience. And so, yeah, that, that, that would be a reason why. But if, if you're looking for a place that has, you know, a lot of different ideas and a lot of different ways of thinking, I think HDS is a great place. Yeah, and if you are, you know, very interested in centering your tradition and practice within your tradition, like you can also definitely do that at HDS. Like we said, there's tons of different communities that meet regularly, and there's just a strong sense of community, community in, in general as well. What do your schedules look like? What are the demands on your class, your time in terms of class, studying, internships, and work? This is a handy dandy job for my bullet journal, hey. which I track and I'm spending my time in. Um, so I work about 15 hours a week between admissions and the pluralism project. And I find that to be doable. HDS in general doesn't recommend um, working more than 20 hours a week part-time while you're getting your degree. And then I would say um, I usually tend to do, so there's about two hours of class. I'm in four classes. Most people are in four classes at a time. Um, sometimes you can do you can do five if you want to have like a stretchy kind of semester. So I'm in four classes, and those each meet for about two hours a week. So I've got 15 hours of part time work, like eight hours of class, and then I don't know how much time I spend studying. Definitely a lot of time studying, um, but I feel happy. I, I really like studying, so. <laughs> Living the nerd life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Embrace it. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm definitely having a stretchy semester. I'm in five classes and this is my first semester. So I, yeah, um, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> but it's been, it's been great. It's been, it's been good. I work about 10 hours in the admissions office per week. I do that in the mornings and then I have one class per day and then I spend, you know, the rest of the day. Um, doing the work for my other classes. So um, it, it kind of adds up to like a regular like eight hour workday most days, um, for me at least. Um, but yeah, I, I, I chose to take five classes and it's, it's doable if you can manage your time and organize things, but it does make things a lot more uh, stretchy. I like that word, yes, a lot more stretchy. <laughs> okay, and then the next question that we have is, about um, do all students have to complete a language component? And they had attended a webinar last night and saying that students were kind of regretting not completing SLP prior to their graduation or their like joining HDS, I guess. Yeah. We'll explain what SLP is. So SLP is the summer language program. Did you do it, Atia? I didn't, no. I, I did it, so get ready, no. everyone. Um, Summer language program is uh, a very epic language program that happens in the summer. I know, I'm, I bet you're shocked by the name. Uh, basically what they do is they take either um, two, two semesters worth of a language and they cram it into eight weeks during the summer. And it is really, really fun. I did it in Greek. I went from like literally not knowing the alphabet on the first day to by the final day, like translating from the New Testament. So it can be incredible in terms of like getting yourself kind of rolling, um, rolling in a language. And all of HDS's language classes focus on reading and translation in religion. So it's very specific. And so you can get 
things out of the language very quickly because you're only looking at kind of learning religious language and practicing translating religious language, not in speaking. So the um, language requirements are a little different depending on each degree that you're in. I'm gonna send the requirements pages for both the MTS and MDiv. And at the bottom, you'll see there's a section about um, language requirements. In general, it's a bar of about an intermediate translation ability in a language of your choice. And if you're coming in with prior language knowledge, you can take um, a language qualifying exam and then you can become exempt from the language requirement, which I actually ended up doing in Spanish, even though I took SLP in Greek. So um, even, you know, whether or not you're kind of like in the language to focus on getting the language requirement done, like languages can be a really kind of fun and productive way to spend your HDS time. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? Um, I haven't done languages yet, but it's definitely something that I'm looking forward to here at HDS. There are a lot of, there are a lot more languages offered than I've seen at any other institution that I've been at. So I, that that's exciting to me. And if you have, like, it's kind of it, it the way that a lot of the language sounds like, or the this is, I'm using language too much. A lot of the the writing about language sounds on a lot of applications and stuff. Um, it makes it sound like you have to be very like particular about like it has to relate specifically to what you do and what you study. And um, well, that's true. Like if you want to pursue a language like Greek, if you are into the Bible and things like that, like you, you definitely can do that, but it's not as restrictive as it sounds like you really can explore um, the possibilities of, of, of like the, the language uh, offerings at Harvard, so. Yeah. yeah, I'm truly not like a, a New Testament, early Christianity studies <laughs> person. I, I never use my my Greek, basically, but I, I thought it was really fun. Um, and you do not at all have to do SLP in order to get out of the language requirement. I know most of the people I know didn't do SLP, but instead did either um, um, two or three, depending on which language you're interested in, semesters of reading and translation. Oh yeah, question. Do you know if MDiv students also move on to doctorate programs or if it's usually only MTS students who go that route? Um, yes, we definitely have MDiv students who move on to doctorate programs. Um, I do not at all think that either the MTS or the MDiv would better prepare you for doctorate programs. They are both really excellent preparation for going into academia and for the process of applying for PhDs. Okay, question about, um, do you have suggestions for the statement of purpose? What is the best thing to focus on? What if I have an idea of what I want to study, but not a concrete plan? That is relatable. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so, so I think in general for the statement of purpose, and I will send to um, a blog post that we have that sort of gives you FAQ tips about how to write your statement of purpose really good statements of purpose tend to do three things. And those are um, sort of describe what your background is that you're bringing to HDS and importantly, how that background prepares you to succeed at graduate school doing graduate level work. And it also, a good statement of purpose, the second thing it does is um, explains why H, the kind of work that you are interested in doing and why HDS specifically is a good place for you to do that work. So this can be talking about resources, maybe different professors, the, the ethos of HDS, whatever it may be. And then the third thing is to kind of give a general direction of what types of things you might be interested in doing um, after HDS. So this doesn't mean that you have to be like, I'm going into X career. But instead, you could do like what Atia just did, which is saying like talking about music as ministry and like knowing sort of what kinds of careers you think that HDS will prepare you for. 
So you want to give a sense of a plan for sure, but it is not necessarily, you know, I plan to do this and I'm signing my contract <laughs> that, you know, promises that I will do this and that's it. Do you want to, how did you talk about this in your statement of purpose? Yeah, exactly that. I was sort of, um, in preparing my application, I was kind of worried that I needed to know exactly what it is I needed to do. And I, if I wrote something, I was gonna be held to that. And like, I can't, I can't change. I can't, you know, switch my course, which is, it's not, it's not how it goes. I mean, um, I, I think for, for me, the statement of purpose was really helpful because I knew that HDS excited me. And I knew that I saw a lot of things here that could be useful to me, but sometimes that excitement, you don't always, real understanding of what it is that is drawing you to this place and so it was a real opportunity to reflect and to think about like what it is I wanted to do and to again like I said with the writing sample it's an opportunity to take stock of your skills and your experiences and really like think about how um, filtering that through HDS's you know um, education can help you go out into the world and do the things that you want to do. And that doesn't really mean like a specific, you know, career path or anything like that. It just means um, knowing the type of work that you want to do. Like, like I said, like, I just, I know that I want to serve people. I want to be of service. That's a, you know, a form of work that I'm interested in doing. And so that can, that can manifest in a lot of different ways. So um, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Are most classes um, paper-based or exams still common assessments at grad school? Yeah, so in language classes, I had um, some quizzes. Um, I don't think I've ever had a kind of, you know, test outside of language classes. So the vast majority of your assessments are going to be through writing papers. Have you had any experiences with, with quizzes or tests yet? Not, not yet, all papers, all just papers, yeah. Yeah, but sometimes these papers can get really creative. Like I have a professor this term who's like really encouraging people to make a podcast or do something else that sort of expands what a paper is. Or last year I was in an incredible class with Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, who is a very prominent feminist Catholic theologian. And um, she had us for our final paper, she, I mean, project. Um, we made TikToks that were sort of like doing um, the kind of feminist critique of scripture that she had taught us to do throughout the term. So occasionally you'll have, you'll have um, sort of assessments that are really expanding the idea of what a paper is, which I think is like a very HDS kind of concept. Uh, but most most of the time it's writing papers. And then we have a question. Can you take the summer language program the summer before you're about to enter? Thank you for that question. And the answer is yes. So students um, can take the summer language program the summer before they matriculate or during the summers between their degree years. And so well, that can be really fun for people because you get to um, come to Boston a little bit earlier and maybe get to know people who are in your SLP class and kind of get settled in the HDS community before classes start. Um, but you definitely don't have to do that and you don't have to do the summer language program at all. But I thought it was really fun and it's a great resource for sure. Okay, looks like we're out of questions for now. So, oh, we got a new question. Awesome. <laughs> Just in time. Where do grad students live? Pre slash post COVID, great question. Does Harvard house you or do most students find their housing in the Boston area? So um, you can either live in Harvard housing, or you can live in um, sort of off-campus housing. Um, most people live in off-campus housing in the area. Um, you can live in Cambridge or Somerville if you're interested in having a shorter commute. 
And then you can go into the kind of outer lying um, suburbs, like you might go to Jamaica Plain or live in Medford if you're interested in having a longer commute, but you might find cheaper rent there. And um, if you want, you can um, get housing through Harvard, which I have a couple of close friends who have that and they really love it because Harvard is your landlord. So when you want something fixed, you just like submit an online form and somebody comes to it. It's pretty amazing. And so you, there are tons of different opportunities there in terms of like dorms or living in apartments, either singles or with other Harvard students. And then there's also a really cool um, place to live, which is the Center for the Study of World Religions itself has housing for students. And it's very kind of um, co-op, like they all kind of meet every couple of weeks and talk about their journeys at HDS. And I'll send the link for sure to all of these housing opportunities. Um, Tia, do you want to talk about your housing? Set up. I mean, I guess you know we are in a, in a Zoom world, but you are still yeah. here. Yeah, I just happen to be in Somerville, um, and yeah. So I I was living in Portland before this, and I moved out here at the beginning of the semester. Um, and I found housing. There are a lot of Harvard Facebook groups um, for for housing as well, um, and that's that's how I found my housing. I'm living with some lovely MDiv students, and just so happened to work out that way. Um, but yeah, yeah, um, Somerville and Cambridge are great places to look, um, but there are also, you know, if the prices seem scary, don't, don't panic. There are places outside of those areas that, that do get a little bit more affordable. So, yeah. Yeah, and I live in Cambridge about a mile's walk away from campus, which I felt like perfect distance. I would just wake up, walk to campus through the beautiful Cambridge neighborhood nest. Um, and so, yeah, lots of people um, live in this area or a little bit outside. And we're happy to answer more questions too about living in Boston itself since we both are living in Boston. Yeah. Okay, we're out of questions. So now we have our backup questions that we can throw at you. Um, I'm prepared. Yeah, do you wanna talk about what classes you're taking? Yeah. Or oh, I will, yeah. Um, so I'm taking um, theories and methods, like I mentioned. Uh, that's the mandatory class for first year MDiv and MTS students. And then I have my mandatory class for being an MDiv, which is Intro to Ministry Studies. I'm also taking an African Religions class uh, in the diaspora. I'm taking a race and religion class, and I'm taking a class at MIT. I'm making use of the fact that we can cross register. So. There you go. Yeah, we've got more questions now, though. So more questions. Yeah. Okay, question: Is campus completely closed now? How have you interacted with the campus during COVID? So, uh, yeah, the campus is completely closed. We are having one hundred percent of our classes on Zoom, and um, honestly, you know, I'm in the second year of my program, and um, HDS just announced yesterday, actually, that the spring semester will be online as well. Um, we in the HDS Office of Admissions are fully planning to be in person in fall of 2021. Obviously, you know, we are living in this pandemic world and cannot predict the future. And so we don't entirely know what the world will look like in fall of 2021, but we're planning on being in person. And personally for me, I've been pretty surprised by the ways that Zoom has allowed me to stay in touch with um, people at HDS. Like I said, like HDS people I think are just community builders. So for example, today we had the most beautiful noon service which was uh, music themed. And so we had people who were on Zoom coming on and um, performing pieces, some that they had written, often about um, religious themes. And we had different people had recordings from, from little bands that they had made with HDS students from afar. And it was so, so just soul filling to kind of be with everyone and listen to music, which is something that is just like so uniting for all people. And so, um, 
I don't know. I, I've overall been interacting with sort of this virtual campus and been impressed by the way that community has transferred to the internet space. Do you have any thoughts you want to add or do you want to pick up the next question? I think you covered it, yeah. Cool. It's a good question. How many, how many students make up the population of the MDiv school and how many people apply each year and what is the acceptance rate? So a lot of, a lot of technical questions. Let's see. Yeah, so I will send the HDS demographics. Um, but for my incoming class of, of last year, we had 100 the Oh, wait, no, sorry. It's not my incoming class. It's the total enrollment as of last year was 142 MTS students and 123 MDiv students. So it's pretty evenly split between MTS and, and MDiv. Um, and in terms of the acceptance rate, you know, I actually do not know at all what the acceptance rate is. Uh, we don't publish that in, in the this admissions office just because it tends to fluctuate so much year by year, especially because Divinity School is such a particular, um, it attracts like a particular kind of um, group of people who are interested in. And so um, it's not something that we release. And I don't know it. So even if I didn't know it, I couldn't tell you because I don't. <laughs> and I'll drop the demographics link into this. Let's see. So we got another question. What kinds of classes can HDS students take at MIT? Um, I, oh, there are a lot of classes. I'm pretty sure a good amount of the, the catalog is open to us um, to cross registers. So if you have a background in something that is offered at MIT, yeah, there's, there's opportunities for that. And mm, I just, um, I will add the course catalog. Yes, there it is, which you can go explore. We have a public course catalog, so you can go explore the different kinds of classes that are offered. And, and I um, will um, add too that I totally thought that like cross registering would be kind of a big deal or something that like your advisor would have to sign off on a form. It's like so common to cross register at other Harvard schools that it's like not even, you just register for the class. So I was able last year to take an ethnography class at the ed school, um, which was really, really um, incredible for me to be able to do with Roberto Gonzalez, who's like a very famous ethnographer whose stuff I've read before. And so if you're interested in cross-disciplinary work, which I think a lot of people in the city of religion are, taking advantage of cross-registering is really helpful. Yeah, it is definitely like I, I had a similar feeling of like dread of having to deal with the advisors and chasing people down to get signatures and stuff, but it really isn't that hard. And then once you're in your Crimson Card thing, yeah, it's all there. Just click on the class and you're good to go. You're good to go. All right, let's see. So we got another question. It says, on the topic of music and divinity, are there opportunities to explore this in student life as well? I'm curious about how to develop these skills in ministry. So it's a good question. Um, we have, I know there's the choir and there's, what else do we have? I, I haven't gotten to experience these things in person yet. I've only heard about them, but yeah. Yeah, there is the HDS Choir, which is really wonderful, led by Chris Hospold, who's our director of music. And I really don't sing at all. I hate singing, but I play the banjo. And so I've been able to accompany them in a couple different choral projects. Um, one of our um, old GAs, Julia Ryman, is, has the voice of an angel. She's going to kill me because this is recording. So <laughs> later we're going to have this published somewhere and I'm going to admit she has a voice. It's true. Yeah, Shout um, out. <laughs> but it's true. And she is right now doing a field education placement, working with a, um, uh, a music thanatologist. Fan so she, I think, too, is a person like Atia who sees music as ministry. And so you can go through field education. 
there's lots of opportunities to kind of make make bands. Um, there's been some courses as well in um, um, kind of um, music ethnicology and things like that, especially when you're going across the entirety of Harvard, you'll be able to find tons of different courses that are involved in music. Um, so, so lots of different ways to get involved. And if you're interested in talking to Julia or anyone else, you can shoot us an email at the Ask Students inbox and we can hook you up. Okay, we're out of questions again. So I can share too what um, courses I'm taking. So I am enrolled in the MTS thesis seminar, which is um, very fun. So the MTS, it's actually not required that you do a thesis, but I'm a nerd. And so I'm doing a thesis and um, it, you are placed in a small cluster of other MTS students who are doing thesis topics similar to yours. And then it's a two semester course. So throughout the year, um, I will be working on a 30 to 50 page paper. And that's one of my courses. Um, the second course that I'm in is um, Magic in the Contemporary World, which is focusing on I think theoretically the concept of magic, but also on um, modern pagan practices as well. Um, the other course I'm in is Religion and Family with Professor Tavi Thomas, who first of all, I mean, she is, she is blowing my mind with her care for her students and everything in between. So I'd highly recommend her as, as a professor. My and then the final course that I'm taking is um, with Stephanie Postel and it's religion around Virginia Woolf. I have my Virginia Woolf somewhere right here. It's, it's been really nourishing to be able to read Woolf, especially at a time like this, thinking about her as sort of an interwar period author. So those are the classes that I'm in. Um, I've been really enjoying them. Oh, I see that maybe more than one person can actually access the links that are in the chat. Yeah, I think the course catalog is having you sign in. Um, oh, the Harvard, course so. catalog is having you sign in. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh, oh, we've been sending oh, all of I the see. links the we've been sending to the panelists and not to oh. everyone. Wow, thanks everyone. I will start sending all the links. Yeah. Well, resend. Yeah. And then you guys will have so much fun clicking through and exploring them all. <laughs> We've been talking about them. Now you can actually see them. Yeah. So. OK, so I'm just sent the Ask Students email. And then I'm sending ooh, the Summer Language Program link, the MTS requirements. And those MTS and MDiv requirements are the places where you'll find the description of the language requirement. And the statement of purpose how to, which is our blog post. And now I'm sending housing resources. And now demographics. And that's it. That's all you've been missing out on. Oh, and the course catalog I have to send to. And you shouldn't have to sign in for the course catalog. So let us know if you have trouble and we can try to send you another link. Um, Wow, thank you all so much. I'm so glad that you will now be able to, <laughs> to access all of these links. Please enjoy this feast of links. Okay, great. Right. Got one question about the GRE. Did you guys take the GRE? Kate, you wanna? Yeah, so the GRE is no longer required. We do not require the GRE. I did take the GRE because I applied in 2019 when the GRE was required. Um, but it's not at all, like it's really not required. It's not like secretly you should submit. Most people don't submit it. Um, it's a personal decision whether or not you want to submit it. Some reasons that you might decide to take the GRE and send it to us are, Maybe if you've been out of undergrad for a really long time and you want to show that you are ready for graduate level work, 
or if um, you feel like there's an area of your application that you want to sort of strengthen by adding in the DRE. You can do that, you're welcome to do that, um, but you're by no means sort of required to. Not submitting a GRE won't hurt you. Yeah. Uh, you guys had uh, such good questions. I'm amazed. Yeah, covered a lot. Yeah, we did cover a lot. Mm -hmm. You want to send any last questions? Otherwise, did you answer, Atia, why you really, yeah, I guess you did kind of answer why you chose HCS. Oh, we have another question. Is it easy to make friends in other programs at Harvard? Yeah, so I, I have made friends with a couple of ed school student PhD students. Um, which has been really fun. There are a number of kind of Harvard umbrella groups that go across the different graduate schools or including um, undergraduates. Sometimes we have undergraduates in our class that I've become friends with as well. Um, for example, like Queer Rights, which is the queer HDS group has done things with One Queer Harvard, which is sort of the broad Harvard um, queer group. And so I have been able to make a couple of, of friends across H, across Harvard in general, um, which has been really fun. Yeah, right. I, I haven't haven't had the chance yet, but I'm sure I will. I'm sure I'm I will sure be taking will. classes and stuff. Yeah. I actually, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm so glad that you all can access the links and if you guys don't have any other questions. Got one more question. Yeah. It says, how many students would you say HDS has from each denomination? So a denominational breakdown. Is there a, is there a chart for that? Uh, you know, I, don't I actually know. don't sure. have a chart for that. If you're really interested in getting a chart, you could email us and I can try to see if we can, we can find that information. Um, but in general, I still say, you know, there's 30 different denominations represented. And so how many students are in each, each kind of denomination or tradition um, really depends on the tradition. And if you want to hear specifically from somebody whose religious identity matches yours, you can reach out to us at Ask Students in the Ask Students email, which I will put in the chat again, just for good measure. Um, and we can set you up to talk with a student who can talk to you about the different events. And then one last quick question that we can do before it becomes 6.30 and we turn into pumpkins. There is a section in the MDiv application where it asks for an explanation for any discrepancies in your educational records. Since I haven't been in school for four years, can I mention the GRE exam that I took in other classes such as a Harvard course that I took through EDX? I would recommend for that question that you send us an email because then we can actually sort of talk to you about your specific situation and, and, and give, you, give you some advice um, around the discrepancy paragraph. Sorry, I know that's not a very, <laughs> a, very helpful, um, a very helpful answer at this moment, but please, please, please send us an email. You can either email the Ask Students email or the admissions. And something to keep in mind too with the Ask Students email is that literally like Atia and I are the ones who read and answer. It's yes. not like dragons or scary, scary people. So you can address it to us. You can, you know, be sort of puzzle, whatever, whatever works. Yeah. All right. I think that we are ready to transition out. So thank you all so much for, to, for coming to this webinar. This was really fun and you guys had really good questions. Um, I would recommend that you follow us on Instagram at Harvard Divinity. Tomorrow, Atia and I will be doing an Instagram takeover in the morning, asking, answering some other questions that people asked us on Instagram. Again, the millionth time, email us. We can connect you with current students. We can answer your questions. Our application for admissions to the fall of 2021 class is now open. 
Uh, we also encourage you to go look at the HDS student blog, which our colleague Jessica is the manager of. She has been posting tons of fascinating articles, getting different perspectives from across campus. And then finally, we have like literally so many admissions webinars that are topic-based, that are identity-based. And um, one of the most important of these epic webinars is that next week on Wednesday, what day is actually Wednesday? October 28th is our open house. So you can go to our website and register for our open house. And then you'll have access to a series of different webinars and resources some opportunities to connect with um, students and with faculty. And so we recommend that you give that a look. All right, thank you all so much for coming and have a good evening. Thank you all, bye.